Great, great. Welcome everyone to the Pearson Business Book Club. My name is Eloise Cook and I'm the publisher for the professional business lists at Pearson. Each month at the book club, we choose a Pearson business or personal development book and we invite the author on to discuss it. They'll also give a masterclass on a key concept from the book. So if you um, need to leave halfway through, the video will be posted online at the book club website. Um, and you can re-watch as well if, if you want to come back. So our, our book today, very exciting. Um, I think this is actually spot on given the interest rate decision here in the UK and in the US yesterday, we've got the finance book. Welcome Stuart. So the, the finance book published last year by Stuart Warner and Sai Hussain. Um, if you haven't got a copy yet, you can download a sample chapter of the book from the Book Club webpage. Um, and we'll also be posting links to the book's website at the end. And we also want you to ask Stuart questions through the session and we'll, we'll get to those at the end. But um, let's, let's welcome Stuart. So, um, Stuart, hi, thank you. Thank you for coming and doing this today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely to see you. Um, I'm going to give you a, a short introduction. So you are the author of four finance books. You deliver training and consultancy internationally across multiple sectors, um, and you hold several non-executive positions. Your goal is to help businesses increase productivity and profits through innovative, engaging, and experiential finance training programs. That's very exciting. Well, thank you. Well, um, well surmised there. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how are you doing today, Stuart? Yeah, um, very good, thanks. Um, the sun is out and I'm looking forward to talking to you about one of my favourite topics um, as well. And, and how are you? Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, likewise, it, it seems to have stopped raining finally and, and it's finally a bit sunny, thank goodness. Right. So um, if you've if you've been to one of these sessions before, you'll know that we we are ask three questions of our authors. So I'll, I will start with those. So, Stuart, tell me, why did you want to write this book? Yeah, um, well, this book is actually although it's called the finance book. It's for non finance people because um, our belief is strongly that finance is one of these topics. It's just too important to be left. To the finance department alone and for many people it's um it's a huge barrier i mean many people go successfully through their careers all the very way to the top of an organization managing to successfully avoid finance and it comes to a point in most people's careers where they need to actually um, understand this maybe they're managing a huge budget budget or on a board of a company and so it's such an important topic and most of the publications out there are actually there to train finance people and um, um the difference of our book is we're we're actually explaining things in a very simple way to a non-finance audience and uh, this is what i do for a living so um i go into organizations and speak to people and um coach consulting etc and helping people to understand it and this is really the um the realization of um what i'm doing in practice and put down onto onto paper uh, and as you mentioned at the start um, so this is well, if you count the fact it's a second edition, it's probably my fifth book. Um, so I've published four books in total and one's a second edition. And um, I, I like to think this, this is the culmination of all of those previous books um, put together. Um, so this is really, um, it's really, it might be a really well explained, really good introduction to finance for a non-finance person. Yes, yes. And, you know, as I said, you're delivering training all the time. So the book is a great vehicle. If they can't get to see you in person, they, they sort of get to feel like they're getting your expertise when you're not in the room with them. Yeah, I often meet people that say like, um, I know your name. <laughs> and sit around and say, yeah, I've actually got your book. I've um, <laughs> had that quite a few times, which is, um, which is really nice, actually. And um, we also sell quite a lot of publications post training as well. So many of the people we have in our courses have gone to purchase the book. So there is a strong link between the two. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so was there anything that surprised you about writing this book, this this new edition? It's um, it, 
Well, I mean, the new edition, it's, um, I had the experience, obviously, of writing um, the first edition. I suppose the unsurprising thing is um, how enjoyable the process is. Uh, I mean, I remember after my first book, um, many years ago now, I said, never again. And that's yeah. the second book, never again. Um, but actually, it, it's, it's a beautiful space, um, actually, the intellectual creative process of, of pulling this together, especially working with a co-author. So my co-author, Sai Hussein, this is not just um, two people coming together. We've really created a lot of synergy by working together. So the, the ability to um, address these topics, which we're explaining to people on a regular basis, and to actually think about it in depth and how can I explain this better? How can I explain this more concisely? Um, how can I make this point more accessible to people? Um, it's, a really, um, it's a really great place um, to be. And um, you know, many people we meet um, who we say, this is our find out we've written a book, they all say, well, I want to write a book. <laughs> uh, actually, they'll say that everyone's got a book inside them. And uh, I would strongly encourage um, anybody who's um, watching this to um, think about actually um, articulating their thoughts onto paper. That, that process is really, um, it, it's, it's a really nice process. And um, at the end, we've got something which is really helping people um, in business and in, in other areas. Yes, definitely. Yes, you're, you're, you're really making your mark in, in helping people's learning, definitely. Thank you. Fantastic. And how do you want readers to feel after reading your book? Yes, well, um, finance is one of these areas that I said at the start, um, most people have a, a barrier against. And so I think the key aspects we want people to be able to feel more confident about finance um, afterwards. And quite often it's when you're in a meeting and um, everybody's talking about a financial topic, whether it's the um, famous top line or the famous bottom line, it takes a lot of confidence to ask what people feel is a silly question, but actually is, is a really good question. And so this book is designed where you can, um, I mean, it's not a cover to cover book, um, it's designed as a reference book. So let's say we're going into a meeting and we know that we're gonna be talking about the company's depreciation policy. We can go to the chapter on depreciation and get a quick briefing on what it's all about. So you get up to speed quickly. And the way the book is designed is very hierarchical. So every chapter starts with a section which is called In a Nutshell. So um, if I'm, let's say I'm short of time and going to the meeting, I can open the chapter on depreciation and I can, in a nutshell, in one paragraph, find out what I need to know. Uh, it then goes through various levels of what I need to know. So um, this will take minutes to read, um, tells you through what's important, why is it important, when it's important. Then it goes to various other hierarchies as to um, optional detail, where to find this in accounts, there's questions to challenge your understanding. So you can approach this book in various levels of depth and um, ultimately want people to feel confident about these topics um, afterwards. And that's the reaction that we've got through um, feedback um, as well. Fantastic. Yes. And, you know, it's something I say all the time that, you know, you're not generally reading business books at work, but you're sort of dipping in or, or on your commute. So it's fantastic that you can use it in a variety of ways. I think that's great. Thank you. Super. So I'm going to let you take over. Um, you can um, begin with your masterclass. If you have any questions for Stuart, um, please pop them in the Q&A function and I will be asking him towards the end. And um, yeah, take it away. Thank you very much, Eloise. So I'm going to start with um, a screen share. Um, and I'm um, going to give you the objectives of what we're going to cover um, this um, afternoon. So I, I thought what might be useful is one of the things we cover in the book is the key financial statements. And these really underpin everything else. And so um, I thought it'd be quite nice to run through today the big picture of how these statements, uh, as the profit and loss accounts, the balance sheets, and the cash flow statement, how they all link um, together. And um, just to be clear, that I'm going to approach this at an introduction level, um, and this is aimed at um, a non-financial audience. Um, so if you're new to this subject, or let's say you've come across these documents and you've always wondered how they fit together and what's in them, um, this will be very useful um, for yourself. That's the plan. Um, I'm going to try and aim for about um, 30 to 40 minutes. 
and I'll try and space my time. Um, it's often challenging because um, I'm talking about this um, for days on end. So uh, I'm going to try and compact something into um, a short time frame for you. So um, I started, you'll see in the center of my screen there, it says, um, what is the aim of this? And I say, um, what is the aim of financial statements? And the aim is actually what I'm trying to do is to tell a story. So it's a story about what has happened um, in the organization. And what we need to do is to read these statements and understand, um, effectively link the numbers um, to the actual activities of the business. Now, just moving back to my previous slide. So we've got three statements here, the profit and loss accounts, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. Let's try a bit of interaction here. So for those of you who are online right now and um, in your chat box, um, can you tell me which of these three statements do you think is the most important to tell the story of the organization? So um, in the chat box, please, uh, which of the three statements, the profit and loss account, the balance sheet or the cash flow, if you want to understand the story of an organization, which one would you say is the most important? So um, I could see a few responses coming in. Thank you very much. So Loretta, p &L, we've got um, Sunny, oh, they're all coming in fast. Um, but a few balance sheets, some people saying cash flow. Right, okay, so um, we've got, um, thanks very much for your um, interactions. This is very helpful. I can see we've got a whole mixture of responses here. But the one that appears to be leading um, is um, the more famous of the three, which is the profits and loss account. Now, what I want to tell you is that is the account which actually gets um, the most press. Uh, that is the one that um, everybody thinks is the most important. But actually, the answer to the question is, um, I'm going to draw you a little Venn diagram here, um, is you actually need um, all of these to tell the story. So if I draw you a Venn diagram on the screen here, um, if you really want to understand what's happening inside an organization, you actually need to look at all three financial statements. So the answer to this, um, which I'm trying to see if anybody has actually said, um, you've all given individuals, that was a kind of a trick question, is all three. Let's um, um, drill down a bit and tell you more about that. So on the left here, we've got the P&L, which is often known as the Profit and Loss Account. That's its full title. Um, these days, you might see it also referred to as the income statement. And part of the challenge of finance, um, the reason why people find it difficult is because there's often this different terms, what is the same thing. What we then have is the balance sheet. So the balance sheet here as well. And then the third statement is the cash flow statement. Now, this is um, known as the cash flow statement or sometimes a statement of cash flows. Um, the balance sheet, let's go back to this. This is probably the one that most people wonder what it is. Um, these days, you might see it referred to as the SFP. What does that stand for? The Statement of Financial Position, um, which doesn't really help, does it? So let me give you a bit of a, um, an easy guide to what's in these um, different statements. So the P&L is simply my income or the business's income and its expenditure. So what the business has earned in terms of sales or revenue and what it's actually spent. The balance sheet, as we'll explore in more detail shortly, looks at the business's assets and its liabilities. Um, so it'd be a lot better if they called it the asset and liability statement, although it's called a balance sheet or statement of financial position. And the cash flow, this is um, the interesting one because cash is cash. And um, that's why um, some of you have said that this is the key statement here. So I can see a few responses. So Jake, um, Angela, um, you've all mentioned, and Sunny, the cash flow statements. Yes, that one does have its importance. So I'm going to um, just drill down a bit into each of these three now and give you a bit more background and um, detail. Um, as we go through it, I'm going to probably refer in passing to um, Greg's. Now, Greg's, um, this is the... Um, sandwich bakery coffee shop that you will see throughout the United Kingdom for those of you who are based here and um, the reason I'm mentioning that is throughout the book we've used um, with their kind permission um, Greg's PLC's financial statements to bring these concepts to life so um, I'll keep referring back to Greg's as we go through now starting with the profit loss account a nice easy way to think about this um, is effectively a funnel so think about a traditional funnel and we have things coming into the top of the funnel 
and then coming out to the bottom as well. So let's start off at the top. What comes in at the top? This is our revenue. So we'll turn this um, the revenue. Now, this is what some people might refer to as um, sales, others as turnover, others as income, and others as the top line. So revenue comes in, and all the way down the funnel, we have various things coming out of the funnel. More of that later on. And let's go straight to the bottom of the funnel and say what comes out of the funnel. Well, we have two things um, come out um, or the bottom. And the first one is probably of interest to people who own the business. And this is the dividends. So this is the way a company or a business rewards the, the investors in the business. And everything that comes out is our retained profit. This is what's kept in the business to invest for the future. And once again, more of that um, very shortly. So um, let's look at the p in a bit more detail. And one of the first things that comes out um, in a p and this great total, which is called the gross and profit. And um, a lot of people wonder, what is gross profit? Well, what do we take out to get to the gross profit? We take out our direct costs. So um, let's bring this to life a bit with um, an example. So um, I mentioned Greg's, which is our case study company in the book. And one of the things that Greg's is famous for um, is its sausage rolls. And a number of years ago, um, it became very famous because um, they developed a vegan sausage roll. And um, this was very, very popular. Many people couldn't actually tell the difference that it was so, um, it was such a good quality sausage roll there. So think about what is the direct costs of a um, sausage roll? Um, what have we got in there? Well, we've got some um, pastry, haven't we? Um, lovely pastry, crispy pastry around the outside. Then we have some kind of um, filling, where it's a, a vegan filling or a meat filling inside. So these are the direct costs, and this will give me the gross profit as such for Greg's. So um, let me, this stage, dig into Greg's um, income statement, as they call it. Let me just put it here at the top. So we see Greg's coming in. Now this, um, just to give you an idea, this was released at the start of March 22. So it's a very, very um, recent um, statement. Their annual report for Greg's, the audited annual report, isn't actually released yet. That won't be till April time. So these are what we call preliminary figures. But I thought I might as well give you the most up-to-date elements for this session. So we see here, we've got some revenue coming in. And this is one of the things we look for in a P&L income statement. We say, let's look at the growth um, of the business. How is it growing? And we set Greg's here, look at the revenue going from 21 on the left to 22 on the right. This has increased by 23% um, in 2022. Now, obviously, there's... Um, as you will all be aware, things have happened in the world <laughs> during 2020 and 2021. So um, there was um, obviously a number of months where the shops weren't fully open during 21. But nevertheless, they're like for like sales. They've had a great year, Greg. So they've um, explored in other channels, digital channels, and um, also they're opening evenings, opening new stores. So it's a very, very healthy um, increase. And if we look further down here, we can see this total here, gross profits. And so it's approximately about 60-ish percent um, of their um, what they're selling goes into the cost of the actual food that they're actually selling across. So where does the rest go? Where does the rest go? Well, one of the other big costs of running a Greg's store, as well as the direct costs, is the indirect costs. So um, otherwise known as the overheads um, for the business. Now, what have we got there? Well, the biggest cost, one of the biggest costs in their business actually um, the biggest cost is actually the people um, in the stores who serve the products to you and also the management who are running and operating the business um, as well. So those, we can't, um, they're indirect. We can't say how many people are allocated to each sausage roll, for example. What else have we got? Well, we've got some um, rent. So for the stores that they actually don't own, they lease those. So there's a rental cost going through um, their income statements. So it's a, through a lease. Um, what else do we have? We have utilities. So obviously with energy costs rising and um, Greg's having ovens, et cetera, in their stores and need to think about this um, as well um, going um, through the organization. And um, one of the concepts, I mentioned it before in passing, is depreciation. So um, depreciation is an overhead as well. Their ovens and the other elements within their stores will need um, depreciating. That comes out and then we get, um, what do we come next? 
we get a total which is called operating profit. So operating profit um, is the next total on our slide. And if I just um, move up slightly, we can see Greg's operating profit here, which has gone up, um, although their top line, their revenue has gone up 23%, the operating profit is only actually up 1%. And part of this is because they're growing the business and some of these costs um, will increase. You can see a large increase here in their distribution and, and selling costs, as well as administration. However, you've always got to look at these relative to revenue or relative to sales. And actually, um, if you look at the bigger picture and compare it back to 2019, they're doing very well to control these um, costs um, as they expand um, the business. So um, operating profits, this is also known, and this is where it gets a bit confusing for those who are non-finance, as this phrase EBIT, or sometimes even the word phrase PBIT. Um, so what does this EBIT, PBIT stand for, which can be the same as operating profit? It stands for earnings or profit before interest and um, tax. Earnings or profit before interest and tax. Um, so this is a key total here, and we can see this um, in Greg's um, income statement just above as well. Um, what comes out next is any finance costs. So as I mentioned, um, Greg's leases its stores. And so um, part of the cost of that lease um, is seen here as um, a finance cost, the way we show it in a set of accounts. And that gives us what's called a PBIT or an EBIT, sorry, PBT or EBT, which profit before tax. And um, if we look down here, because the finance cost has gone down, Greg's has managed to grow it by 2% um, over the last um, financial year. And then um, what comes out next is our taxation. So we have to pay tax. Now, Greg's taxation bill has actually gone down um, because um, the government had some incentives to invest over the last year. And then we have the bottom, which is the PAT, profit after tax, or the EAT, the earnings um, after tax, which we can see um, in Greg's um, income statement above is 120 million here. So they've managed to grow their profits um, after tax and um, as well, they call it profit for the financial year. OK, so what happens now is um, Greg's can ever pay dividends, which they do, um, generous dividend payers, or they can keep it in the business as retained profits. Now, this retained profit, this is the link to the balance sheet. So um, let's move across now to the balance sheet. Let's move across to the balance sheet and have a chat about that. And this is Greg's assets and its liabilities. So a nice way to think about this is... Um, you're taking the word balance, and we can take that into a bit more depth. And I can draw a set of scales here, and we'll see what is actually balancing in a balance sheet. And on one side of this, we have our assets, and there's two types of assets that we have. Okay, so we have um, our long term assets and also our short-term assets. And um, let's um, um, drill down a bit into these two. So long-term assets, what have we got? So if you think about a, um, think about, um, a Greg's shop, um, what have they got in the shop? They've got um, some ovens. So um, let's put a picture of an oven here. Um, they've actually got the, um, some of the stores they own themselves. So um, let's bring a store um, here. Some of the stores they own, some of the stores they lease, they also own supply chain elements. So um, in the finance world, we call this um, PPE, which is not um, personal protective equipment, but it's actually um, property, plants, and um, equipment um, as well. But, um, equip, so fit it into that box. Okay, um, what's on the short-term um, aspect here? Well, um, think about um, what Greg has in its store to um, build, make all the sandwiches, et cetera, is they have um, all the fillings, et cetera, there. 
and they have um, bread cakes ready to uh, fresh bread cakes ready to sell and we term this our um, inventory and this is also known as stock so stock or um, inventory we will see um, in there and um, what else do we have um, in this box now I'm gonna have to actually make this um, bigger because I've got a few more things to um to, um, to add so let me just move this up and um, let's make these um, slightly bigger here. Okay, so um, in the short term box, um, as well as infantry stock. Now this doesn't apply to Greg's as much. We have um, money owed from customers. So a little bit of this for um, partnership stores. But for um, other businesses, um, the, this could be quite a large balance um, in their balance sheet. And um, the term for this is sometimes referred to as a debtor and sometimes referred to as a receivable as well. As I said to you before, part of the challenge of finance is often the language that is used. There'll be different terms of the same um, thing. And um, what else do we have in here? Um, we have um, a bit of cash um, as well. So Greg's got some cash um, on their balance sheets. So three core things there in the short term. Um, then we come to the right hand side. Uh, on the left, these are all um, assets. Um, let's look at the um, right hand side here. And um, on the right hand side, we have two different forms of liabilities. I believe a little box space at the bottom. So as we see with the um, assets, we have some long term liabilities and some short term liabilities. Now, starting the long term, so if you've got property, plant, and equipment in the business, this needs financing. So, what many businesses have in this box is their debt. Um, in um, Greg's case, what they have here is lease liabilities, which does apply to a lot of businesses um, as well. Um, on the short term basis, uh, what we have is money owed to suppliers money owed to suppliers. Okay, um, I'll have a look at um, Greg's balance sheet in a second and I'll show you this, but you'll see there's a space here on my scales to make them balance. And uh, what is the missing part of the jigsaw? Uh, this is our equity. And this effectively represents money owed, or, or it's effectively the investment um, to our shareholders. So there's two parts to this. Is number one is the original share capital. So when the investors started the business, or um, if you've raised further finance for investors during the life of a business, you'll see this represented here as share capital. And number two is reserves. And the important part of the reserves is this retained profit, which we mentioned a short while ago in the PL accounts. So if I just zoom out shortly, what we can see here is, as I mentioned, retained profit links to the balance sheets. And let's draw a little arrow around to here. This is the um, link back into the balance sheet. So this is where it gets stored effectively um, in the balance sheet um, over time. So that's the link between the two. Drilling back into the balance sheets in a bit more detail. So on the right hand side, we call this our equity and our liabilities. Now, the balance sheet um, representation I've showed you here on purpose um, is just to emphasize a point is that you can balance a balance sheet in different ways. So what I want to do now is show you Greg's balance sheet, the latest one that has been um, released. Let me just cut and paste this in for you. And I'm gonna put this to the, um, the side. And a bit of space. There we are. So um, you'll see in Greg's balance sheet, they've actually balanced it in a slightly um, different way. So um, it's, it's the same kind of core ingredients here. So rather than calling these long term assets, um, we've called these non current assets, the long term assets, non current assets. You'll also see often the term fixed assets in the business. And you can see the biggest um, element for Greg's 
balance sheet here is this 390 million, as well as the 282 million. And this is basically the property. So they own lots of vehicles, um, they have lots of factories, supply chain elements, and right of use assets represents the stores that they're leasing as well. That's a big part of their balance sheet, as you see looking at the numbers. And then we have the short term assets, which um, they have termed current. So this term current, non-current um, is widely used under um, international accounting standards. The biggest part of their current assets um, is the cash. Now, um, I mentioned in the commentary that this is um, high because they're about to um, spend some investments and we'll come back to cash very shortly. Um, you'll see here um, 40 million of inventories. So obviously they have, although a lot of the, the goods are perishable, they do have some longer life goods like drinks and um, et cetera in their stores. Then what we have is current liabilities. So that, um, going down the bottom part of this balance sheet, this is the short term um, here, and we can see um, trade and other payables. Now, one thing to look at, conscious of time, but um, it's always worth looking at this, is we look at the balance between trade and other payables, which is money owed to suppliers, and trade and other receivables, which is money owed from customers. So the top one here is customers, and the bottom one here is suppliers. And you can see Greg's, um, what we could term advantageous position, that um, it's got little receivables, but large payables um, there. Anyway, um, that is um, a bigger topic, but I just wanted to give you a hint um, into that. Uh, what we also have here in Greg's um, balance sheet um, is we have the, the long-term liabilities. And um, this, um, Greg's is a reasonably unusual business, it actually doesn't have much um, or any debt and instead it's got these lease liabilities, which also appear in the short term for those less than one year. And this is the uh, representing the shop leases that it has. This is the future um, rental commitments. So what we have um, is total liabilities. And there's a little bit more I need to add to the bottom of the balance sheet, which um, I'll just put on now. Just to make this um, balance. So we add all these together, and this goes as a, a total termed net um, assets. And um, as you see here, looking at the numbers, four, four, six, that balances with Greg's um, equity, which is also four, four, six. Okay, um, and the important total here, just to link you on to what I talked about before, look at the retained profits, they call these retained earnings, we see 420.5 million. This shows the, kind of the previous success um, of Greg's. Despite paying dividends, this is what's been kept in the business historically. And this represents effectively the owner's stake or owner's equity in the business. Okay, so um, let's move on now. So we have about 10 minutes left just to talk to you about the cash flow statements. Now, um, I use the analogy of the funnel, if you remember, for the income statement. I used a very similar analogy for, um, for the cash flow statement. So as with the income statement, the way to think about the cash is also like a funnel. And this time, as opposed to having revenue coming in, we have three categories to actually have a look um, at. And um, what these categories are is the first one is um, operations. Or let's call this um, operating, it's probably a better term to use here. So we have operating cash flows, and this is cash flows from running the business. What we also have um, is investing cash flows. And this is where we've spent money in a business um, into capital expenditure. So essentially, this is largely looking at net capex. Then the third area we have is financing cash flows. Now, the question I asked you at the start, if you remember back, back at the start, is how do you tell the story of a business? And um, a few of you mentioned the cash flow statement because this does tell a brilliant story. Because one of the things I'm looking at in a business is the operating cash flows 
are they sufficient to pay for the investments? And similarly, if you want to invest those investments, so if Greg's, for instance, invests in supply chain efficiencies, digital platforms, new stores, that should lead to more operating cash flows. Now, for some businesses, but they need to use financing for their um, capex, and that's fine as well. That's, uh, but you can see this part of the story. And if you want to attract finance, you can't just go to banks or shareholders and say, I want some money. They're going to say, what do you want the money for? So there must be a story which links back to that. And then finally, we can say the operating cash flows, are they sufficient to pay dividends back to our shareholders? This is financing cash flow. Or are they sufficient to repay some of our debts? We can see debt repayments there. And similarly, if we're attracting finance, the ability to attract finance will depend upon the operations of the business. So these are three things we look at in a cash flow. And what comes out here at the bottom is the net cash flow. So that's either an inflow or an outflow. Hopefully it's an inflow. And what that does is basically it explains the movement in the cash balance from year to year. So um, the net cash flow will show either the balance going up or the balance going down. So if I just scroll back a bit, um, let's have a look at another link here. I mentioned to you cash was also in the balance sheet. If you go back to the balance sheet here, you can see probably just about I'm circling cash. And then this will be explained in the cash flow. So you can see the retained profit from the income statement or PL flows um, into the cash flow statements. And you can also see that um, the cash is the movement in cash from year two is explained in the cash flow statement um, as well. Let me give you another link, which is very, very useful, is what I'm looking at is essentially how do the profits in my business, I can take any of these profits, but I'm taking the profit after tax um, here. And um, let's change color for this linkage. How does this link into my operating cash flows? So this is a really important question for most businesses because um, you can show lots of profits, but the question is, is that profit and um, is it converting um, into cash? So the cash conversion or the cash conversion ratio is absolutely critical um, in a business. Let's um, finish off this little section looking at um, our friends Greg's PLC. And um, let me put into this little sketch we're drawing up um, their cash flow statements for the last one, which was the end of December 22. Okay, here we go. Now, if we just get a bit more detail at this, I'll make it slightly larger for you to see. Cash from their operations. We can see that this was 251.5 million. This is after tax, after interest. I'm just going to go scroll back up to the income statement or the PL. We can see the profit was 120 million. So Greg's is an incredibly cash generative business. Although it's making 120 million profits, um, the actual operating cash is 251 million. I mean, this is a fantastic story. Um, most businesses would uh, love to have a relationship between cash and profit like this. Um, often it's the other way around. Let's look at where else we've got in their cash flow statements. We've got outflows from investing. So we can see that the last year they spent acquisition of property, plants and equipment, 100 million. So Greg's is really scaling up their business. You can read about this on the investor relations section of their website, how they're investing in the supply chain stores, digital platforms, etc. And that is the 251 million is more than sufficient to actually finance their own investments, which is one of the reasons they don't need debt. The final bit of their cash flow shows cash flow from financing. 
Now, as opposed to being an inflow, as in you would see if a company had raised money, this is an outflow, which is why it's shown in brackets. And the biggest element in here you can see is dividends paid. Um, so it took a bit of a, um, a drop last year during COVID, but you'll see that they've resumed the very generous dividend level this year. And so once again, the 251 million is sufficient to actually provide financing for those dividends. So it's, this is a really good story we're seeing here in Greg's um, cash flow. And the final linkage we have here is you look at their cash balance. So it explains that overall cash has just gone down slightly by seven. This is takes the cash balance from 198 to 191. And you'll see the same totals here in the balance sheets. So if I scroll up here, 198, 191. So you've seen the linkage now between all um, three um, of these. So just a few closing thoughts. Um, I'm going to scroll out so you can see here the big picture on one screen. Um, a nice little way to um, think about this, so a nice little closing um, analogy here, is um, the balance sheet um, is like a, a snapshot. So I've put a picture of a, a camera here. So I've taken a photo of the business, of all its assets and liabilities. And it's very useful to understand the story, to see the photo of the business at the start and the end um, of the year. Whereas if you look at the income statements or the P&L accounts, this is a video. So what I've, what I've seen here is a video which takes me from one camera, one snapshot, one photo to another. I can see the video there. And also the cash flow is another video. So um, I've also looked at the journey from um, one balance sheet to another in terms of cash. So I can look at my, you know, imagine you're um, looking at a big event, you wanna see what's happened. You look at the photos, you look at the video, and this I'm looking at the photos and the videos of these three. So um, this has been a very fast, quick overview um, of the core financial statements, the um, P&L, the balance sheet, and the cash flow. I hope what you've seen in this short session is um, some of the kind of nice analogies, like look at the P&L account and the cash flow as funnels, look at the balance sheet as scales and a, and a snapshot as well. And also you've seen some of the linkages between the three. Now, finance is a huge topic. Um, and um, I hope I've scratched the surface today. And uh, what I hope I've done is I've whet your appetite to potentially learn more in the future. Now, if you have any questions, we're happy to um, take these um, now. So I'm gonna pass the reins back to um, Eloise to, um, to um, structure this last part of our session together. So um, back to you, Eloise. Thank you, Stuart. That was absolutely fantastic. I, I think you've set a new bar with the, the whiteboard functionality. <laughs> that was wonderful. I loved how you were scrolling in and out and adding stuff. Absolutely fantastic. Right. Thank yeah, you. we've got some we've got some questions coming in. Um, so please feel free to to keep sending them. Um, so I will start off with what do companies mean by underlying growth when assessing the income statement? Oh, this is a this is a brilliant question. I mean, um, how long have you got? <laughs> we could talk <laughs> a long time about this. So it's a great question, Jack. Thanks very much for um to asking it. Um, is so basically the growth I looked at before the twenty three percent um in um Greg's business. So that is um essentially their absolute. But really, what is important here is their um underlying growth. What, what I'm gonna, if it's okay, I'm just going to screen share um one more time. And um, this has just um, helped to um, answer this question a little bit um, as well. So let me just get back onto the screen share and I'll try and um, do this um, briefly so we don't spend, um, take all our time. So um, hopefully you can see that now. Yeah? So this is um, what I've taken, this is a presentation, which um, so when Greg's released their preliminary results, um, what I talked about were they release a presentation. And it's really worth having a look, if you want to understand finance to, Go into the investor relationship um, investor relations section of a company's website, and you'll see this. Now, what I talk about here is, as opposed to the word underlying, they talk about L for um, L. Um, does anyone know what L for L stands for? Um, you can put it in the chat box um, if you know what um, L for L. It's quite an important one to have a look at. 
is quite similar to underlying. Can't see any coming through. Um, all right, um, it stands for like for like. So um, really to get to this underlying is, you know, I can open a new store and I can grow my revenues quite easily. But once we look at um, like for like or underlying growth, we can really see the true performance. I'll show you uh, another slide in their deck um, here. So um, it, they've actually showed the like for like sales here between the three categories of um, delivery, which is another expansion, the app and evening. And so you can see that um, they're going up because the, what they want to do is strip out just growth um, for just pure new stores. They want to actually see compared to last year, how do we do on an underlying basis? Now, the other way to, um, so hopefully that answers the question a little bit, but the other way to look at underlying is to actually get into a bit more depth. Um, a good company to have a look at um, is Nestle, if you're interested. Now, we need to go into Nestle's investor relations website, and they publish um, a, a document which is called um, Alternative Performance Measures, um, otherwise known as an A. PM. This is an amazing era because it's growing in importance. More and more companies are publishing alternative ways to understand their business. And so what Nestle do is they strip out um, any business that you're disposed of. They strip out at, um, anything which is not perform, which is that they're no longer interested in. They take out any kind of one-off items. Maybe there's been some litigation, for example, to try and get to what is their real underlying elements because all these other transactions um, influence their um, sales. So um, a simple answer to your question, Jack, is underlying is really ignoring one-off items, ignoring um, just growth caused by simple expansion. What is the real growth um, of a business? But you have to be careful how a company is defining it. <laughs> so I've tried to compact a huge answer into a short time. I hope that's okay. Sounds good to me. Um, yes, Jack says thank you. And um, I'm going to try and read this one out. Um, are EBIT or PBIT and PBT slash EBT the same thing, just without interest? Um, <laughs> but the simple answer is yes. Um, so just be expand it just a little bit um, there. Um, is um, generally what we're looking at here is finance. Um, net finance costs or finance income. So, for example, a business might have investments and savings and earn um, interest um, separately, or they might have debt and pay um, interest. So it's the net of the two which comes between EBIT and EBIT. Um, sorry, my apologies. Just for a second. Between um, EBIT and um, EBT. I was just reading the question and um, you swap around the E's and the P's, but it's good there that you've managed to use these interchangeably. And it's the interchangeableness of things which often is very challenging for um, individuals. If you're sitting there and um, in the same sentence, the finance person is saying, well, let's talk about sales. Now let's talk about turnover. Now let's talk about revenue. Now let's talk about income. Now let's talk about the top line. And as a non-finance person, you're thinking, what, are these different things? Are these the same thing? So um, the terminology um, is key. And um, I often see my job not essentially as um, teaching numbers. So going back to the tagline of the book, which is um, understand the numbers, even if you're not a finance professional. Um, I'd actually interestingly argue is the numbers is the easy bit. The hard bit is actually the language. And so um, my job is really a language trainer. I'm teaching people this language. And to um, to quote um, Warren Buffett, I mean, he's got a much longer quote, but essentially what he's saying is that finance is the language of business. So if you want to succeed in business, whether you're a um, graduate starting out, or I mean, maybe you're even an accounting trainee, you want to get your hand around, head around this, uh, whether you're a middle manager, senior manager, a board director, an investor, and you want to understand business and understand the language of finance is absolutely critical. Absolutely, yes. Um, here's another one. Why is retained profit a liability? <laughs> um, well, it's a good, um, that's a great question. So um, when you say it's a liability, um, so I put it on the right hand side of those scales, um, if you recall, um, it's not um, a liability in terms of debts, 
um, or um, money that we owe to suppliers. But effectively, let, let's say we have a business and the business closes tomorrow. And we had a great business. Let's stop the business now. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll pay off all of our debts, et cetera. And we'll sell all of our assets. Where does the money left over go to? Who does it belong to? It belongs to the shareholders. So um, the reason it's stated in the liability section of the balance sheet is because it represents effectively what is owned to the owners. And the owners and the, and the um, people who own the business, people who own the business, are often different elements. I mean, this, this can be, you know, when we've got separation of large companies and own the shareholders, it's easy. But when we've got small businesses, this confusion, well, let's well, say it's my money. Uh, well, no, no, you've got the business and you have the director. And what we're representing the balance sheet is what is owed, effectively owed back to you. Um, the other reason why it's um, important there with um, the retained profit um, is this is used to pay dividends. And so when I look at a company's balance sheet, if I'm an investor, for instance, I'm thinking, how, what is the ability of this business to sustain dividends in the future? And an interesting thing is um, a company can make a loss in the current year, uh, um, make a loss, a company can have no cash, and it can still pay dividends as long as it has retained um, earnings as well. So it's a critical total. So I hope um, I've answered that question. Please feel free to um, ask further if um, you have further questions on it. Yeah, that, I, I thought that was great, Stuart. So Norberto has two questions. Um, can we apply this model to startups? And do you have a how-to for startup companies? That sounds like he, he wants you to write his business plan. <laughs> and also, will this work on WHF companies? So I'm assuming that's work from home. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so work from home company, new company. I mean, yeah, these principles um, um, apply. Now, just to be absolutely clear here, just let's look at the, diff the distinction between what's termed a sole trader. So let's say um, you and I start a business and we, we don't form it as a company or anything. And it's still useful to think about it in these terms. But if we decide to form a limited company, to set up as a limited company, by law, so as a company's act, we have to produce this profit and loss balance sheet or cash flow, whether a, a small business with one transaction, <laughs> whether a multi-million business, these same principles um, apply. Um, if you're a sole trader, then things are slightly different. So um, if you maybe this WFH business is a sole trader and um, maybe you can look at things on a little bit of a simpler um, basis. But I would argue this, this structure is very useful. Because um, it uses what's called, um, it's a strange term, it's called the accruals principle. Um, we call it in the book business accounting, rather than using that um, strange term accruals. But actually um, separating when cash comes in and out of business and think about when a transaction takes place is really critical. So, for example, let's say we, we make a sale in our WFH business. <laughs> We're to get paid for 30 days. When did we earn the money? Did we earn the money at the time we made the sale? Or do we earn the money when we receive the cash? And this distinction between cash and profit as such is really important, whether you're a small business or, or, a, or a multinational um, international business uh, um, as well. And the question is, uh, do I have a how to? Well, I'm sure in the Pearson Library, uh, I'm sure, Eloise, um, given your wide variety of books that um, um, we have in the Pearson, there must be a startup book there. Yes, yes, we do have a few actually. Yes, and I, I won't, I won't get too salesy, but if they they want to search for that on on a bookshop, um, there are a few. Um, yeah, but get in touch if if you want some recommendations. And one last question. Um, back to Greg's again. Um, twenty twenty two profit was up, but net cash flow was down compared to twenty twenty one. What is this indicative of? <laughs> Well, when you say it, it's it's down, I mean, it's, it's always a question of looking into the detail. Uh, let me just check the timing and just see if we can just go back into the detail and have a looking at that rather than actually um, answering it generically. Because, OK, let me just share my screen um, one more time. OK, here we go. Let's drill down into the um, cash flow. Now, I just want to caveat what I'm saying beforehand and uh, say that, um, just to be clear, 
I'm not here as a spokesperson for Greg's. Um, Greg's kindly gave us permission to put the, um, actually the, the um, 2020 accounts into um, um, our last book. And these are also preliminary figures. Um, and so um, please um, take what I say as um, I'm just, um, just giving you public domain information at this stage. So net cash flow we can see here is um, my seven. So what, what is the big difference between these two? So looking down these numbers, what I was go from the left column to the right column. Now, um, the first thing to point um, out um, here, let's use it, let's, um, let's highlight this in a nice purple, is um, look at the cash from operations. So it's slightly down here. Now, if you read the narrative, so with the preliminary results, there is um, some commentary there. So um, this is um, generally, um, and I have to kind of read the detail, um, could be down to working capital movements. So this is inflows of um, their inventory, money from customers, money from um, suppliers, etc. But the big difference, um, working down this cash flow statement, is the one that I highlighted before. And you might the red arrow is slightly in the way here. But can we see here the acquisition of property, plants, and equipment? In twenty one, it was fifty million. But in twenty two, is a hundred million. So quite openly, Greg's is ramping up their investments. It's a very um, investment heavy business in supply chain and other areas here, creating new outlets um, as well, investing in technology and systems. So uh, there's an extra 50 million that's gone out um, for um, um, acquisition of that. And the third reason why, so there's three reasons why there, is if we look at the dividends, so in 2021, they paid out 15 million of dividends. And obviously that makes sense is during COVID, just being a little bit more cautious with their cash, but then it's up to a hundred million. So I think these three most explain the changes, but a, a general answer to the question is, um, you've got to look into the detail here to see um, what is actually um, happening. So I hope um, that answered the question. Yes, yes, that was fantastic. Well, thank you, Stuart. That, that was that was really fantastic. Um, we've got a poll that's just popping up um, for your feedback on the event. Hope, hope you all enjoyed it. Um, hopefully you can answer that. And in the meantime, I'm going to share my screen. Well, thank you, Elise. I, I certainly um, enjoyed it. So um, thank oh, good. you. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, so hopefully once you've finished the poll, um, if you want to stay in touch with, with Stuart or Sai, you can find their website, financebook.co.uk, which supports the finance book, um, wonderfully named. Um, and I think there are sort of templates and extra materials there. And you could also connect with them on LinkedIn. So yeah, do, do get in touch. Um, I'm sort of offering you, you their connection to you if you want to send them a message. I hope that's all right. Yeah, sure. Very happy to, to connect with people. If um, I mean, please don't just hit connect, but if you put a message saying, I listen to your webinar and have a question, uh, I'm always happy to reply to, um, to those. Thank you, thank you. Right. Right, and, and if you're interested in coming to our next event, um, um, that's on the Tuesday, the 25th of April at 2 p.m. UK time. And our book of the month will be How to Get On With Anyone by Catherine Stottart. Her masterclass will be on the life-changing people skills you need to connect with any personality type. So um, please sign up for our mailing list. Please um, have a look at the book club website um, and we hope to see you next time. So thank you, everyone.